And there's the evidence. Again, my name is Eric Braxton. I'm the executive director of the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing. Thank you so much for joining us today. This webinar is on grassroots fundraising as movement building. Build your base to fund your budget. Uh, the webinar will be moderated and led by GIFT, the Grassroots Institute for Fundraising Training. We're really excited to have them on board, and we'll also uh, have representatives from uh, Survivors Organizing for Liberation, Casa de Paz, and Volleyball Latino, and the Philadelphia Student Union, who will give examples of the uh, grassroots fundraising that they're doing to support their youth organizing work. Again, this webinar is part of... FCYO's Youth Corps webinar series. And Youth Corps is a set of programs that's designed to create regular learning opportunities for youth organizing groups from across the country to come together, share tools and resources, build relationships, uh, and, and ultimately to build shared power. The, this topic of grassroots fundraising is one that's really important to us. I think as folks know, a big part of FCYO's work is about uh, is about getting resources to youth organizing groups so that you can do your work more effectively. Um, and we've talked a lot about the challenges of relying on foundation funding. Um, from the, the surveys that we've done, youth organizing groups are about 90% reliant on foundations for funding. But we know that with foundations, uh, they give larger grants of blocks of money at one time, um, but things go in and out of style with foundations, um, and foundations may or may not be politically aligned with the work that you're doing. So we've all talked about the need to build independent financial resources and become less reliant on foundations. But how do we actually do that? What does that look like? Um, and from the, you know, many people have been interested in how do we build alternative institutions uh, and other ways of raising money to support our budgets, but that work is really challenging. From the scans that we have done, grassroots fundraising, raising money from individual donors, is the most reliable, most effective way of building independent financial resources to support your work. Uh, so that's why we wanted to have this, this webinar. Um, we know that this is just a start uh, um, on, on how to do this important work. Um, but, and we know that GIFT, the, the reason that we invited GIFT to be part of this webinar is that for over 20 years they have been training folks, um, organizers on the ground, specifically folks of color, on how to build, uh, how to do grassroots fundraising. Um, so we're very excited to have GIFT on board. Um, and uh, with, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Veronica Garcia, who's going to lead and moderate this webinar um, and, and share with us some of what GIFT has been doing um, and, and introduce us to the other panelists. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so my name is Veronica Garcia, and I work with the Grassroots Institute for Fundraising Training, and I am program director at GIFT, and essentially that means that I coordinate all of our uh, training and educational engagements. And I'm really excited to be here with you all this morning um, and also uh, to be joined by three uh, incredibly awesome panelists that you all will get to hear a little bit more from. Um, so uh, for now, I'll go ahead and just uh, let you know, we're gonna be um, speaking, we're gonna be hearing from Mimi Madrid Puga, uh, who is with Survivors Organizing for Liberation and Buried Seeds of Resistance. We'll also be hearing from Sarah Jackson with Volleyball Internacional and Casa de Paz. And we also have Timothy Coleman with us from the Philadelphia Student Union. So I'm gonna start off with a little bit of an introductory piece. Um, we're gonna get into exploring grassroots fundraising a little bit. Um, and then towards the, the later half of our time together, um, we'll move into the panel section and you all will be able to hear from the folks that I just mentioned. So first of all, we wanted to start off by getting a sense of who is joining us on the call today. And to do that, we wanted to engage you all in this uh, newer polling platform. Uh, and so the question that you see on your screen is what is your primary fundraising role? You can participate by using your cell phone and you're gonna send a text 22333 to Veronica GARS122, V-E-R-O-N-I-C-A-G-A-R-C-122. So you're gonna text 22333 to that name and then go ahead and select your answer and we'll get a sense of who's joining us on the phone today. 
I'll give you just a few minutes to log in. We have a couple of polling questions. So you're going to want to stay in the system once you're able to log into the system and respond to the poll. Veronica, we're getting a few requests just to repeat the, the instructions. So you're going to follow the instructions at the, uh, the top of your screen there. You're going to text the number 22333. Text that number to the title there, V-E-R-O-N-I-C-A-G-A-R-C-122. And then select your choice. You'll get a confirmation that you've entered the poll, and you'll select your choice, A, B, C, D, or F. Alternatively, you can also go ahead and just type your response into the chat if you're having trouble logging on to that. It looks like we're having some, some trouble, folks, not seeing it on the screen, Veronica. Are you? Okay. There we go. All right. So you see your selections there. And like I said, feel free to use the chat option as well if that's a little bit easier. We also just wanted a chance to introduce you all to some of this newer technology. Um, I'll get into a little bit more detail about uh, our body of work at GIFT, but one of the biggest things that we're starting to move into now is to introduce folks to, um, to some of the kind of up and coming technological pieces that we can encourage folks to use in your fundraising. So feel free to engage as, uh, as is most accessible for you, whether it's through this polling piece or through the chat box, um, and just to indicate, are you coming to the conversation today as a volunteer, as a staff member, a development director, an executive director, or possibly a board member. Great, so we've got our first responses coming in there. Great, so we've got, we've got quite a few staff members. Um, in terms of what's reflected here on the poll. We've got a volunteer, that's great. So we'll talk a little bit about volunteer involvement in fundraising uh, and how important that is specifically when we're talking about grassroots fundraising. So that's awesome. Thanks for joining us today. All right, so just a, a little bit of a sense of who we've got uh, joining us on the call today. Slides here. Okay, so we're gonna follow up with a couple of additional questions. Uh, again, just to get some sense of how you, where you all are at, how you arrive uh, to this call with us today. Let me go ahead and just switch that out. All right, the next poll question, which of the following best describes your primary fundraising challenge? A, it's hard for me to ask for money. And again, feel free to enter in the chat box. B, I'm afraid that I'll fail. C, I don't have enough knowledge or skills. D, I just need more chances to practice. Or E, I love fundraising so much that I've run out of people to ask for money. That's great. So we've got some folks that are excited about fundraising. Awesome. Excellent. Great. So that's, this is, I, I love what I'm seeing reflected. Um, one of our biggest challenges when we start talking about grassroots fundraising um, is just literally the fear of the ask. That's where a lot of folks are starting off from. Um, and that's okay because we unpack a lot of the social components that really kind of uh, build up build us up to that point of fearing the ask. Excellent, so you see uh, a handful of folks here saying, I don't have enough knowledge or skills. And again, that's, that's part of the puzzle that GIFT exists to, to try and respond to. We'll go to the next question here. What is your organization's biggest fundraising challenge? So we talked, we explored kind of your own individual challenges. What do you perceive as being your organization's biggest fundraising challenge? Is it A, finding donors? I'm sorry. Here we 
three of them, is it A, finding donors, B, keeping the donors we already have, C, diversifying our funding sources, D, not enough staff or high staff turnover, or E, increasing demand for our programs and services, so an increasing demand and more revenue. Excellent. So again, the, the issues that you all are indicating here are um, issues that GIFT uh, is very specifically equipped to help organizations begin to explore. Um, and we'll talk about these pieces just a little bit as I go through my, uh, my brief presentation on grassroots fundraising. We'll talk a little bit about finding donors and who our prospective donors are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about using grassroots fundraising to diversify our funding sources. Um, and then we'll address uh, a little bit uh, what, what you do when you have a smaller fundraising uh, department, right? Some of us don't have a department at all to speak of. So we'll get into this a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail through my All right, so thank you all so much for participating. So you see here that GIFT was founded in 1996. Um, we're celebrating 20 years of helping grassroots, primarily uh, organizations led by people of color, to learn how to incorporate grassroots fundraising into their own organi organ uh, organizing. So we believe really, really strongly that um, people absolutely have to be at the center of fundraising when we're talking about movement building. And that's a lot of um, what our kind of value system around grassroots fundraising comes from. You'll see here just a reflection of our major programming areas. We actually just wrapped up our biennial conference, happens every other year. We were in Denver this year in mid-August. Um, that conference is called Money for Our Movements. And I always encourage people to keep an eye out for it. Um, people who are going for the first time report always having a, an incredible experience and um, we have a lot of folks that keep coming back for that conference because it's such an incredible opportunity. We bring together over 700 uh, social justice fundraisers from around the country. So it's a great learning and networking opportunity. We also Veronica, conduct- I'm Sorry, just to jump in real quick. Um, I, I think the, the slides may not be advancing for everyone. Um, so we may wanna go and try and do the, the screen share again. Okay. Give me just a second to get it open. Apologize for the technical difficulties, folks. What's that? Oh, I was just apologizing for the technical difficulties. Oh, yes. Sorry. Just to let you know also, Mimi, Mimi is on, and um, I can unmute her when, when it's her turn. OK. On the phone. Okay, you all see that okay? Yep. Well, mm -hmm. Perfect. So let me just go into the slideshow view. Okay, so, um, so then we also have our training, capacity building, and uh, consulting services. And through those programmings, uh, we work with a number of organizations all across the country. Um, within the last couple of years, we've actually started working with organizations outside of the country, uh, internationally, to explore grassroots fundraising and how that actually fits into movement building work. Um, and then finally, we publish the Grassroots Fundraising Journal. Uh, it comes out uh, every other month, six issues a year. Uh, an annual subscription starts at $49 and, uh, and is priced on a sliding uh, fee scale for organizations to make it more accessible. Uh, but the journal is full of all kinds of very practical articles that speak to, uh, again, exploring issues of grassroots fundraising and then looking at uh, very practical tools and strategies that you can apply to your grassroots fundraising. So those are the primary uh, program areas that GIFT participates in. 
And we're gonna dive uh, into grassroots fundraising and explore a little bit about the significance of grassroots fundraising. Why, why is GIFT such a huge fan of grassroots fundraising? And Eric talked about it a little bit in his introduction. Uh, he talked about the fact that this really is among one of the most uh, sustainable ways that we know to date, it's been proven time and again, uh, to help us sustain our movement building. And this is across a number of causes. So when, I, when we look at this first diagram that I put up, um, I use this diagram just to demonstrate to folks uh, to kind of get us all on the same page in terms of what we're aiming for when we talk about movement building. And so this is a piece that's taken from uh, Love with Power, Practicing Transformation for Social Justice. Um, and it's a piece out of the Movement Strategy Center, which is a gift partner. And so we see here the change that we're essentially aiming for when we're working to build movements. Um, we're looking to kind of, first of all, impact the individual you see there. The individual ideally essentially uh, contributes to organizational change, organizational strategies change, contribute to movement and cultural change, and eventually, uh, ideally, we end up with the world that we want to live in, right? Larger scale social change. And so when we talk about movement building work, we kind of understand that we start at the level of the individual and we really have to focus on developing um, leadership and, and uh, giving folks access to political education to really develop our movement building. And the same is true for grassroots fundraising. And the reason that we embrace grassroots fundraising is that it's an incredible opportunity to actually move in that direction. So this slide here explores the current landscape of philanthropy in the United States. Um, and I ask here, how much money do you think was donated as charitable contributions in 2015? And this is total, in total, when we're thinking about corporate contributions, individual contributions, foundations, and bequests. And for those of you who may be a little uh, unfamiliar with the word bequest, a bequest is essentially um, what happens when somebody with wealth passes on and they leave their wealth. Uh, they leave their wealth sometimes as inheritance to family members. When we're talking about bequests, we're talking about supporters that leave their wealth uh, to our work to support and sustain our work. And so in total here, we see that in 2015, more than $300 billion uh, went into philanthropy, right? So that's a lot of money. And we're not necessarily saying that our types of organizations, our movement building social justice organizations have access to all of that 300 plus billion. But we're saying that even if we only had access to a small chunk of that, that's a significant amount of money. So our focus is really on figuring out how we begin to tap into that. So you see, we're starting with a pretty huge pie, right? $300 billion, more than $300 billion worth of a pie here. And when we begin to explore how that's cut up in terms of who is giving this money, where this money is coming from, we see really quickly what? Where is this money coming from? It's individuals, right? That's what this slide shows here. And this information comes from a resource called Giving USA. Uh, they put out an annual report that reflects the previous year's charitable giving. And what, what I want to tell you all, I want to leave you all with the message that even though this data is compiled annually, it rarely changes. Giving USA has been putting this information out every year for many years. Um, and from year to year, the only real change is in the amount of dollars. But the way that money is coming in, the pieces of the pie, remain consistently the same across years. And so across years, consistently individuals are giving um, about three quarters of all of the money that goes into uh, charitable giving in the United States. So you see that corporations are one of the smallest uh, segments there. Uh, about 4% of that more than 300 billion in 2015 came from corporations. And you see that 16%, uh, about 16% or so, 59 billion came from foundations. Um, and then bequests come in at about 9% or $32 billion. And so a really interesting thing to note here is that essentially what we're saying is that in 2015, dead folks gave away more money than corporations, right? And so that's, that's a little bit startling. And so then we ask ourselves, what is that about? Why, why do these trends look that way? And there are a couple of ideas, right? When you think about motivations, um, when we think about corporate giving, 
rarely are corporations actually pursuing any kind of real social shift. Um, very rarely do you hear corporations and their giving arms talking about social justice. Um, and so we think about corporate giving, and oftentimes that giving is really more about kind of um, the, the public image, right? And kind of putting out, sending out a message to folks that they're engaged in society. Um, and so just kind of some, some interesting information, right? It starts to kind of clarify the picture for us about why it is that grassroots fundraising holds so much promise. So this slide here, I like to point out a little bit more evidence here. What you're seeing in this chart here is the way that giving by income has changed over the years from 2006 to 2012. And really, really quickly, what the data here demonstrates is that folks who are in income brackets of $25,000 a year or less have actually significantly increased the amount of the, their income that they give uh, to charitable issues that they donate every year. Um, so from 2006 to 2012, folks who made $25,000 a year or less actually increased their giving by over 15%. And then you go down to the bottom here and you see that folks who made $200,000 or more a year have actually decreased their amount of giving in that time span from 2006 to 2012. Right, and so again, we see some kind of interesting dynamics start to sprout up here, and we can explore, you know, ideas about about where that discrepancy is coming from. Why is it that people who have less, it seems like the data is saying, are giving more? Um, and the the most simple answer that we can come up with at Gift and and across the networks that we've had a chance to connect with, is that that's reflective of the fact that the people who understand most are the people who are most prepared to give. Um, and so again, these are trends that are, are unchanging across the years. And you'll see here we have listed some very specific reasons for why we would prioritize grassroots fundraising. So in grassroots fundraising is all about focusing on individual donors and our relationships with individual donors and our base, right? Our individual base members. So if we think about the financial reasons for focusing on grassroots fundraising, we can consider the fact that um, oftentimes, our donations from individuals are far more likely to be unrestricted funds. Um, individuals are a lot more reliable in terms of their commitment to continue giving year after year. Uh, oftentimes, when we apply for funding or support from foundations, um, oftentimes they'll tell us upfront, this is a, a one-year funding opportunity, and so there are no opportunities for renewals or, or reapplications. Um, when we're talking about fundraising from individuals, we also have a shorter turnaround time. Right? If we're going to apply for funding from a foundation, uh, oftentimes we're looking at turnaround times of anywhere from three months to six months between the time that you submit an application and you get a response. So that's quite different from walking up to somebody and asking for $10 to support my cause. And in that moment, the person makes a decision. You either get the $10 or you don't. Right. So it's a quicker turnaround time. We can focus on people power as well. So specifically with what I just brought up uh, about corporate giving, for example, um, corporate giving is not at all reflective of people power, right? Corporate giving doesn't at all reflect where the people are at and how people are feeling about their communities and their community needs. But when you talk about really emphasizing fundraising from your base, grassroots fundraising from individual supporters, we're really empowering people to, to tr truly have an investment in the movement building. So they're giving to the movement building and it brings them to the table and leaves them feeling like they have a real opportunity to engage with our movement building. In terms of political reasons, uh, there's a significant uh, amount of accountability that comes along with uh, really emphasizing your individual donors. When your individual donors invest in your work, they're gonna be that much more invested in having some say about how you're doing your work. And that keeps you accountable to your base. Um, and so those are some of the key reasons uh, that we talk about really kind of uh, the need to emphasize on grassroots fundraising. Um, I'd encourage you all to include any additional thoughts that you have in the chat about uh, the benefits of grassroots fundraising, really focusing on grassroots fundraising over, for example, institutional fundraising, like writing grants uh, to foundations. So feel free to, to share any ideas, any additional ideas that you have in the chat box. Um, I said that grassroots fundraising is really about an emphasis on personal relationships, 
right? And that is where grassroots fundraising is movement building. When we talk about movement building, we talk about how important it is to be out in community and developing relationships. Developing relationships with folks who support our cause, developing relationships with partners who have access to, in some cases, additional resources, uh, de uh, really developing our relationships with allies, allies who maybe uh, aren't necessarily prepared to take a stand, but are open, are open to kind of being brought on board. So movement building really focuses on all of that relationship building. And by extension, grassroots fundraising very similarly emphasizes relationship building. When we're talking about relationship building with donors from a grassroots fundraising perspective, we're really focusing on uh, cultivating the relationship. And so the diagram you see here demonstrates kind of how GIF talks about that cultivation. So we talk about the fact that oftentimes we'll start off with folks who we call impulse givers. These are folks who don't necessarily have a history with our organization. Um, maybe we're at an outreach event out in the community. We've been invited to go table uh, at, let's say, a community health fair. And as folks are walking by, uh, they're interested in, in the literature that we have on the table. And so they stop. And maybe we have a jar out, a donation jar, and, and somebody drops in a $5 bill, right? So this would be somebody that we would consider an impulse giver. And the idea of cultivating that relationship is really about kind of helping that person move from an impulse giver to becoming a habitual giver. A habitual giver is going to be somebody that's a little bit more intentional in their giving. They're beginning to actually develop um, a relationship with your organization, and they're beginning to see themselves as a member of your organization or your community, your, your organizational community. We want, to, we want to help shift habitual givers then into thoughtful givers. Um, and these are the folks who are actually starting to think about what their capacity in is in terms of how much they can give. Um, they're convinced, they're on board. They absolutely know that they believe in your mission, in your cause, and they wanna be a part of the movement building. And so they're prepared to be a little bit more thoughtful about how their giving can demonstrate that uh, alongside their organizing. Um, and then here you see that thoughtful givers ideally eventually become planned giving and planned giving is reflected through the bequests um, that, that I referred to uh, just a few slides back. GIF doesn't uh, necessarily focus too much on that plan giving um, piece. We really tend to work more with folks in kind of, uh, kind of building up capacity at that front end of the relationship building. Um, and so how do you actually develop your grassroots fundraising program? How do you design uh, your campaigns? What kinds of strategies do you, do you explore? Um, that's really more of GIF's focus. But you see here essentially what we consider a full cycle um, of, of developing your individual donors. And so when it comes to building relationships, um, a lot of times folks will start from a place of asking, well, who are my donors? Who, who am I supposed to ask for money? Uh, and, and what we say is that you start with the folks that you know, right? You already have a base. You've got folks that are already supporting your work. You've already got partnerships. You've already got uh, alliances with other groups and organizations in community. And so you start with who you know. Um, it, it's like building your base for organizing. You're building your base of donors. And at GIFT, we really emphasize the fact that as social change makers, as movement builders, we have a responsibility to ask for the money to sustain our work. And so some of what we do with groups is we work on unpacking um, some of the anxieties and apprehensions and fear that a lot of time will feed into uh, making that ask more challenging. But we also really believe that through our fundraising, we also have an opportunity to shift the way that the, our stories are told. Uh, oftentimes in movement building work, we're challenged by the fact that our stories are, are being told about us and for us. And so grassroots fundraising is really about trying to center um, the way that we tell our own stories and create those opportunities for ourselves through grassroots fundraising. And so who are your best prospects? Your best prospects, as you're starting to think about embarking on grassroots fundraising and thinking about who are these individual donors that I will pursue, are folks who are ABC compatible. And when we talk about ABC compatible, we say that A stands for ability. 
So these are folks who have the ability to give. I work with a colleague uh, sometimes, uh, we partner for trainings, and he says, who are the people that give? He'll ask the audience. And after a pause, he'll say, the people that give are the people that work. And that's the vast majority of us. So there are a lot of people that have the ability to give, right? And there are a number of ways to explore uh, of someone's ability, everything from you know, just your observations about somebody's behavior, potentially somebody's, uh, you know, lifestyle, um, all the way on up to really sophisticated resources that, uh, like subscription services that you can pay for to actually research folks. Um, if we're talking about base building, though, and really building deep and genuine uh, relationships with folks, um, we're really looking at exploring people's ability to give in, in a more direct and more personal way than some of these bigger kind of um, databases that you can research. The B is going to stand for belief. So your prospect is going to be somebody that you know believes in your cause. They're familiar with your organization. These are the best prospects. Um, we also talk about prospects with regards to belief in terms of prospects who don't necessarily know your organization and aren't familiar with your work, but you know that politically they're aligned. You know that they share some values. Uh, you know that they share an investment in the cause. Um, so folks who have a belief. And then finally, um, folks that you have contact with. So either you know these people personally, you have a personal relationship, or you have a relationship that can help bridge that gap and, and provide the introduction. So when you're looking for prospects, again, you're looking for folks who meet this very basic ABC test, folks who we, we, we have a sense, have an ability. We know that they have a belief, a couple of different ways to gauge that. Um, and we have access to them. We're able to get in touch with them, whether it's, it's a phone number or an email address or a mailing address, um, they're reachable to us. So these are our best prospects. So once we define, we're talking about kind of creating grassroots. This is a, a, a very general uh, overview of grassroots fundraising and, and basically the, what it looks like to create a grassroots fundraising campaign. Um, so the broad overview is you're gonna, you're gonna identify first your prospects and that's what you use that ABC tool for. The next thing that you wanna do is you wanna look at exploring your strategies. Um, and here um, you'll see that I'm trying to demonstrate for you as we explore the different types of strategies that we uh, engage individual donors with, you see some reflection here on what a typical uh, kind of an average response rate is. And so, what is the strategy that we see gets, uh, gets the, uh, the, the best response, right? It's the personal face-to-face -face solicitation, literally looking somebody in the eye, uh, meeting them where they're at, really making a very convincing uh, argument for your cause, uh, and then asking them for their support. So that personal face-to-face -face strategy um, is going to give you a return of about 50%. About one out of every two times that you ask somebody for money face to face, you can anticipate that they'll say yes. A phone call is the next most effective strategy with about 25% of asks that come in on average by phone call resulting in a yes. Um, and so then you can see for yourselves going on down the scale there, um, the probably the least responsive strategy is direct mail to new prospects. Um, and direct mail is actually creating a, a hard mailer. So you have a letter and you include a reply envelope and, and you mail it off to all the contacts that you have mailing addresses for. So this, I think, also kind of reiterates the fact that relationships are absolutely vital to successful grassroots fundraising. Um, and you see here that the closer your relationship is to somebody as you go into the ask, the greater the likelihood that somebody is going to respond with a yes, right? And then you see the note here at the bottom. Of those who say yes, about 50% will also give you less than what you asked for. And so these are the types of things that you're taking into account as you're trying to determine what types of strategies you're gonna, you're gonna hone in on. Are you gonna organize a phone bank where you bring folks together and, and spend an evening you know, reading a script as part of a fundraising campaign? Um, are you going to schedule individual meetings with maybe a, a, a team's board member and a staff member who go out and meet with your donors and make the ask, right? So these are the types of things that you want to consider as, as you're looking at deciding what types of strategies uh, you want to base a grassroots fundraising campaign on. 
And so uh, individual face-to-face -face asks are generally the most effective way to secure new donors, right? And increase donations as well. One of the things that um, we tell groups that we work with is that it's a lot uh, less expensive to retain an existing donor, a current donor, than it is to recruit a new donor. Um, so we're always looking at ways to really emphasize really sustaining our relationships and building that depth of relationship um, into our donor base uh, to help retain our donors. Um, and, and here you get a sense of how many folks, what is the ratio? How many folks do I actually have to have identified for this ask to reach my goal, right? And so if you're doing a personal face-to-face -face ask, um, you want to ideally identify four prospects that you can ask um, and you can anticipate that one of those four will result in a gift. So these are all very, very general numbers, um, but, but again, there's some basis for them and historically have demonstrated across campaigns and, and experience um, that some of these uh, patterns remain pretty consistent. So I wanna um, begin to wrap up my presentation for you all uh, with five tips for successful fundraising. And the first is just literally that success is asking. If you are not hearing no, when you're asking for money, then you're not asking enough, right? If all you're hearing is yes, then you need to keep asking because you're on fire. Uh, and if you're not uh, asking enough, you're never gonna hear a no. Hearing no is part of fundraising. And so um, we really encourage folks to stick with that commitment to making the ask. Success is making that ask over and over again. Set a goal. That's absolutely priceless because without setting a goal, you can't actually come back to evaluate your campaign. And so there aren't a lot of real tangible ways to look at how you strengthen your fundraising. So set a goal, set a goal and, and use that to gauge your performance. Invite as many people to give as possible. The more people you ask, the more people will give, right? And so what we tell folks is that you only have to start with asking the folks that you're comfortable with. Um, most of us have a good crew of people in our circle that we're comfortable with, right? So you start with the folks that you're comfortable with and you work your way up. Believe in your cause. Your belief in the cause must be much stronger than your fear or any anxieties or apprehensions you have about asking. Um, and that's something that I'm really proud of. In all of our work through GIFT, um, we're oftentimes working with organizations that believe very, very deeply in the causes and the movements that they're working to help build. So most, most of us have this first point. We've got this and we're ready to go. Um, and then finally, be sure to thank everyone who gives. Um, it's, it's the most polite way to behave, but it also goes a long way in terms of building uh, your relationships and, and really kind of creating that genuineness, again, and depth of relationship with your donors. So I want to go into uh, our panelist section now. And actually, I'll take a quick pause at this point and ask if anybody has any questions. Feel free to use the chat. Um, for any questions that, that you have. Let me. Okay. I'm just scrolling through the chat to make sure we didn't have any questions. And so Lynn asks, do you have any data for response rates to an email ask? Um, I, I don't at this point, Lynn, I'm not, uh, I didn't incorporate any of that data into this presentation, but I actually do have some resources that I can share. Um, some of that data is up and coming. It's data that's just now starting to be collected, but there's some really useful stuff out there that I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm happy to share. Um, and we can, we can explore maybe how we share towards the end of the, uh, of this session. But yes, I can definitely provide some uh, some information on what email engagement looks like with donors. Um, suffice it to say that increasingly right now, the trend is really towards engaging donors uh, by email or online. Um, that number continues to increase over the last couple of years. And so, so more and more, we see folks wanting to be engaged that way. 
Uh, and again, I'd be more than happy to share that information with you all. Do you have any resources about membership levels fundraising through developing a membership structure? Uh, we do, Kendall. Um, and just to answer that question really briefly, I would direct you all to uh, explore our website, grassrootsfundraising.org. And there you can access our archive uh, of the Grassroots Fundraising Journal. Like I said at the beginning, the journal is chock full of uh, all kinds of really practical articles on grassroots fundraising uh, topics. And so I know we have a number of articles there that are archived on uh, membership and creating a membership uh, campaign and organization. Um, and then if that's not enough, we can absolutely refer you to folks who have done that successfully and, uh, and are always happy to engage with people. Uh, Michelle asks, any recommendations on how many asks to make to the same individual within a particular time span? For example, one calendar year. Um, so we could get into kind of a, a lot of um, really kind of uh, defining questions, Michelle, but probably the simplest answer is to rely on your understanding. Sorry about that. Uh, is to rely on your understanding of your relationship with your donor. Right. And so um, I don't know if this is a, a fair, uh, a fair example or not, but I'll use it. Um, think about asking your friend to a movie. Right. So how close is that friendship? And did you ask yesterday? Did you ask last month? Is this a friend that maybe you only go out to the movie with twice a year? And so that's, you know, how you know your relationship. Um, and so I use that example just to really emphasize the relationship piece. That's, that's really where the significance of the relationship comes into grassroots fundraising, is that through building that relationship, you get to know your donors. Um, and you have to be really observant to, to start to pick up on how your donors want to be engaged. And so most donors will tell you. Another good way to find out the answer is just to ask your donor if you feel comfortable enough in your relationship to just say, how often is it okay to ask? Um, that's actually a question that I ask donors often, but it's, it's absolutely a fair question. Um, and you can couch it as, you know, as saying, I'm trying to be respectful. I'm really just trying to kind of respect how you want to be engaged with. Yeah, excellent. So, um, so we're going to go into the panel now, and this is the part that I am super, super, super excited about. I'm excited about all my work with GIFT, um, but I've had a chance to spend some time with these three folks just preparing for this presentation today. Um, and I'm really excited for them to be able to share uh, some of their own experiences with grassroots fundraising. So I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves. And Sarah, we're going to start with you. So we'll go to Sarah Jackson. Hey, guys. Um, Veronica, I don't see the. OK, there's the slide. Um, I'm just trying to, so I should just go skip through Mimi. Okay. <laughs> My name is Sarah Jackson, and I am the executive director for Casa de Paz and Volleyball Internacional. Casa de Paz is a hospitality home, which is located directly across the street from the Immigrant Detention Center in Aurora, Colorado. So what we do at Casa de Paz which uh, it means house of peace, by the way, uh, is we welcome guests into our home who have been just released from the immigrant detention center and they need a place to stay while they're in transition to their family or their friends who are somewhere in the United States. So they get, will get released from the detention center in Aurora. Uh, these, are, these are people who have never been uh, to our city before, so they're completely homeless and lost, but they come to our house, which is across the street. We have a home where they can spend the night, they can call their family and friends, let them know they're okay. Uh, we have a phone that they can use to connect with their family. They'll get them their bus ticket or their plane ticket, and then we will have volunteers take them to the airport and to the bus station so that they can uh, get back together with their families. Uh, we have um, guests who stay with us from all over the world, from Africa, from Asia, from uh, Central America, from Mexico, all over, from Europe. Uh, 
And um, the, the way that we keep our doors open and the way that we pay for all of our expenses, for our rent, for our food, for the bus tickets and plane tickets for our guests, for the internet, for the, for the phone line, uh, is through a volleyball league called Volleyball Internacional. Uh, we originally were called Volleyball Latino. When we started our league, we had six teams of volleyballs, uh, volleyball players, and all of the volleyball players were Latino, uh, except for me. Um, everybody was Latino, but as we've grown throughout the years, we've been in open for almost four years now, the Volleyball League. We've grown from six teams to this season we have about 80 teams in our in our league and so now we have people from all over the world uh playing in our league so volleyball internacional is a is a fundraiser uh to keep casa de paz open and uh we'll, i'll i'll be able to share a little bit more about how we do what we do uh later on but that's kind of the brief overview of what what i'm uh leading over thank you sarah um, and now we'll go to Mimi. Can you hear us, Mimi? Uh, Let's hello? go ahead. Are you there, Mimi? Yes. Hi. Go ahead, Mimi. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So my name is Mimi. I am a co-executive director of um, training and organizing at Survivors Organizing for Liberation and Buried Seeds of Resistance. And so SOL has existed for uh, 30 years. We're celebrating our, our dirty 30 this year. So that's exciting. Um, but we've pretty much, we've been doing um, work with survivors of violence who identify as uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, gender nonconforming, and two-spirit here in Denver, Colorado. Um, and uh, Buried Seeds of Resistance uh, is our youth organizing um, uh, collective that works around uh, art, culture, uh, and media making. And one of the things that we've done recently is we've changed our name to reflect more about um, what it is that we're looking for and to build together as a community. So Sol and B Seeds reflect kind of this uh, symbiotic relationship between intergenerational organizing within our communities, because we were really tired of um, kind of like that parent organization, you know, youth program, child dynamic. And we wanted to see more in our communities, um, more of a, a, of a, like, equal and collective organizing when it comes to to making sure that uh we are looking for liberation and trying to to support each other as survivors of violence um kind of the four uh key components or strategies that we do in our community one the first one is our 24-hour hotline and that is a hotline where lgbtq folks who survive violence whether it's intimate partner violence or discrimination on the street or bias motivated crime or bias motivated violence, or even when LGBTQ folks are looking for resources in community, like going to shelters or uh, clinics or hospitals or in schools um, that can call our hotline and get some resources and support. Um, additionally, recently we've been working a lot with LGBTQ folks who also experience state violence. Um, and so with that, we have our advocacy piece. And so within our advocacy piece, we're able to give extended survivor support. So anywhere from emergency food to like transportation um, to even to court support for young people, because we know that when young people who are LGBTQ, who are people of color, who are targeted, um, have the backing of community that there's actually lower sentencing for young people um, in general. So we do that. Um, additionally, we do trainings and technical assistance for um, service providers, shelters, um, and other uh, professionals within our city and our in our state that um, still, you know, today we still have to talk about dignity and respect uh, for LGBTQ folks. And so we do that as well. And then we have our community and youth organizing intergenerational um, work that we do. And so we work with families and we work with uh, folks who may be incarcerated at the time 
uh, to, to bring safety and wellness and, and the justice that they want to see um, and self-determine for themselves as survivors. And just, just to throw it out there, um, I feel like my fundraising and like my movement building um, actually came from my grandma, who I totally believe was two spirit. You know, like I knew, I know she had lady lovers all over Texas, um, but she was very much about uh, fam raising. So raising fam and connecting with family um, in order to like support each other, whether it had to do like with money or resources or food or clothes. And so I just want to shout out my grandma, Dolores Puga. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you so much. All right, and now we're gonna hear from Timothy Coleman. Go ahead, Timothy. Hey, I'm Timothy. Um, I work as a grassroots fundraiser at the Philadelphia Student Union, PSU. So PSU is a community-based youth organizing project um, led by high school students with adult support. And we focus on educational justice and the fight for public education in Philadelphia and across the country. Um, and my role as a grassroots fundraiser is to integrate fundraising into like each aspect of our movement building and base building. So political education and leadership development of young people, the high school students who are our members, that's like the core of what we do. Um, and my job is to make sure that fundraising and conversations around foundation funding and like the problems with foundation funding, um, sort of some of what we've been covering today. My job is to make sure that all of that is integrated into our political education. So we have workshops where students learn about the effect of foundation funding um, and like sort of nonprofit industrial complex stuff on our movements. And we also do skill building as part of leadership development where they like learn skills for doing grassroots fundraising. Um, and a lot of those skills actually are really similar to the organizing skills that they're already learning at PSU. Um, yeah, so I also, also part of my job is to get other staff and board members at PSU excited about fundraising because it is kind of like a tricky subject or skill for so many people. Um, and I also, per more personally, I come to grassroots fundraising from like two different directions. So partly from being involved in organizing and movements for a long time and seeing how under-resourced our movements are and how much the ways that they do get funded it can affect the work and sort of our visions. Um, and then I also have worked as a grant writer at, for small grassroots nonprofits and sort of seen firsthand a lot of the problems with foundations and foundation funding and all of that. And so for me personally, I really like appreciate grassroots fundraising because of how much it's about building relationships and sort of building strong relationships that can actually sustain all of the work and how raising resources from people who are really committed to our movements can push them forward and instead of like narrowing them or channeling them in these weird directions. Thank you, Timothy. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions that we're gonna use just to kind of uh, explore some themes around grassroots fundraising. But I wanna encourage you all to feel free to use the chat um, and we'll, you know, we'll try to refer to it as, as it makes sense. Um, if you have any questions that come up for the panelists. So the, the first thing that I wanted to kind of hear from you all about um, is an example of a grassroots fundraising success story. And so that's another big piece that we promote around successful grassroots fundraising is that we actually ha we have to be really intentional about celebrating our wins um, and not just celebrating our wins, but really kind of taking our campaigns after the fact and, and, and using them to explore how we improve over time. So I'd really love to hear from you all if you can share a specific example of a grassroots fundraising success in your work. Am I going first again, or are we doing the alphabetical thing that we talked about? Yes, Sarah. <laughs> okay. Well, so when I started our volleyball league, I was really, really nervous because I didn't think that anybody would play at a volleyball league uh, when there were already tons of other places to play in Denver. 
Um, but I knew that our volleyball league would be different because we were going to use our money for Casa de Paz. So we had a little bit of a different angle. And so we decided to spend some money to put a, an ad on the radio for inviting people to come join our team or our league and two teams signed up. And I was really frustrated and nervous and sad because I thought that was going to be the worst volleyball league ever. I mean, two teams playing each other every single week, you would get so bored and the tournament would be like one game, it would be horrible. But what I decided to do is I decided to go to people who I knew were also very interested and committed to immigrant rights and literally begged them to join our volleyball league. I knew they didn't play volleyball, but I knew they were passionate about immigrants' rights and keeping families together. So at one point I was literally on my knees begging my friends who I uh, knew would be passionate about about uh, this idea. And I asked them to join uh, or to, to register a team. And I got four more teams to say yes. So, so it, I believe that was a success because then, you know, two teams weren't playing each other every week in our, in our league. And then we just kept growing from there. So that's kind of one of my favorite success stories from our volleyball league. Thanks, Sarah. Mimi? Yes. So um, one of our greatest successes or grassroots funding uh efforts that we've had is 500 for five and 500 for five came out of this desire and need um, to bring our community together and to be able to fund as timothy said right like foundations and you know government funding have so many strings attached and we were tired of that um, we were really wanting to be able to bring folks to be able to um, support our more what always is considered radical work, which is like the basics, right? Like to fund uh, survivors in the ways that these foundations don't want to and how these government grants don't want to. And so we came together as a community, um, our, our young people, uh, families with, of those young people, um, our volunteers and our supporters, and we had a real conversation about values and wanted to see like, what 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 is valuable to us what are the numbers that mean a lot to us and so we arrived to this place of 500 um because of you know indigenous uh resistance um on this land and we thought that that was a very powerful number at first we had a lot of pushback because we're we're sometimes we're like super visionary and we had some folks being like 500 is a lot um, but when we think of it, the the strategy that we had is we are going to be asking folks in our community um, to stretch, um, but also to to have ownership and commit uh, to our collective liberation. And so we arrived to the the dollar five, the dollar amount of five, um, and we thought of doing this for five years. And so what we the strategy that we did is that we called upon 23 of our supporters, 23 of our volunteers, folks that believe in the liberation of LGBTQ folks um, to come together uh, and ask five additional people in their community, in their families, uh, to join them in giving $5 a month uh, for, for a year to, to support uh, be seeds and soul more more radical work or survivor support work um, and and what the idea behind that was as well um, it wasn't just about the number but it was also about the time and the energy um, that we wanted to cultivate within our community right because once someone has given five dollars maybe it's the grandma down the corner from our office who we talk to her about like her murals and the gentrification that's happening in our city um, we were able to connect LGBTQ issues and liberation with that as well. And this grandma was able to give um, and stretch uh, and give for the very first time in like decades. And so that's that's where I, our idea was. Um, we're now in year three. And um, we were very excited that the first year we had 125 uh, donors. Um, and I'll talk about the challenges later, but the real beautiful piece uh, about the success of this grassroots fundraising effort for us um, 
was being able to bring in more folks, bring in more folks that had never heard about solar receipts or had never known how to support LGBTQ liberation, wellness, um, and health in Colorado. Thank you, Mimi. Yeah. Um, so, Timothy, uh, uh, an example from your experience of uh, a successful grassroots fundraising campaign. So about a year and a half ago, um, PSU was sort of surprise evicted from our office. We were on a month to month lease and we only had 60 days notice that we were being evicted. And so we were just kind of like scrambling. Um, and the eviction was really a result of gentrification in the like surrounding neighborhood. Um, and so we spent a little bit of time just trying to find an office immediately to move into, but it turned out that in any of the places that are like accessible by public transportation in Philly, there wasn't anything that we could afford. Like all of the rents were much more than what we had been paying. Um, and so we ended up launching a crowdfunder and Indiegogo campaign to raise money from individuals to try to get a new office. Um, and it was ended up being a really big success. I mean, we didn't really know how it was gonna go. It felt like very risky when we started it. Um, but over two months, we raised, our initial goal was $11,000. We ended up raising over $20,000 from over 200 different people. So, you know, most people were making a donation of somewhere between like 50 and a hundred dollars. Um, and this allowed us to like sign at least on a new office, which was really essential because it was, um, you know, it was really holding back all of our work and especially our base building work to not have a space to hold meetings out of or work out of or for young people to just like come and hang out in. Um, and so, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more later about the details of like how that was successful. But I think one thing that was a unexpected part of the success was um, starting a conversation around youth spaces and how there like aren't really any youth friendly spaces in Philadelphia. And part of our focus and trying to fundraise for the office was talking about how important it was to have for us to have an office in order to have a youth friendly like hangout space. And that ended up having this unexpected effect of also bringing that issue to like attention of a larger group of people. Great, thanks Timothy. So um, so definitely what, what I uh, am hearing from all of uh, your examples are, um, definitely some inclusion of some of the pieces that I talked about um, during my, my short presentation. Um, so Sarah, I heard you talking about literally just having to meet your donors where they're at, right? So you had to figure out how to like strategize and find your prospects. Um, and in some ways, like some application of the ABCs formula that I introduced, right? So like, how do you find your people and the people who actually are already connected to your issue? Um, Timothy, I hear you talking about, I think the biggest thing is just technology. So that's a, a big up and coming piece that, um, that you know, GIFT is trying to stay on top of, but just really exploring the way that technology trends are impacting the way that we communicate um, with our donors and also conduct our fundraising. Um, I heard all of you talking about cultivating uh, relationships, right? So all of you talked about the importance and the significance of relationships. Um, and then Mimi, you explicitly talked about diversifying funding sources for power, right? So actually like tapping into people power by uh, using grassroots fundraising. So given all that, um, it'd be great if you all could reflect on some specific tools or strategies um, that, you know, that kind of speak to how you reached your success. One of the things that we try to do at Volleyball Internacional is continually connect um, our players to Casa de Paz. Uh, so, we, for example, last night we had guests who were at our home and we also had volleyball games and they're held in different locations about 30 minutes from each other. But but I was uh, I was at Casa de Paz. And, um, and so I decided to bring our guests with me to our volleyball games. And I introduced our guests to some volleyball players. And I, 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 I let them see the real faces of the people that they were helping by playing in our volleyball league. 
We also do things throughout the year uh, to keep in mind those uh, men and women who are still detained in the detention center that hopefully one day will be released and come stay with us. So we do things like Christmas cards. We write notes of encouragement and hope, uh, Valentine's Day cards. Um, and we, we set up a table at our volleyball league so that the players and the kids and the spectators and the fans can create a, a card uh, with, with words of, um, of affirmation and love and, and uh, solidarity. And then we give those cards to the men and women who are in the detention center. And because we've been able to provide those connections to our volleyball players and they understand that the money that they're spending is going to a, a good and worthwhile cause. Not a week goes by where I don't walk into the gym and there isn't a donation. It is very, very rare for me to walk into the gym and not see something that a volleyball player has brought for our guests, whether that's clothing or food or cleaning supplies for the CASA or a coat for our guests, because when they are released from detention, they're normally in the t-shirt, whatever they were caught by immigration in. So because we've been able to, to keep the, the mission of Casa de Paz in front of the faces of all of our volleyball players, we've been able to cultivate another base of volunteers um, just kind of naturally. Great, that's awesome. Sarah, I have a quick question from uh, for you from Daisy. Daisy is asking, uh, how much did you charge for folks to participate in the volleyball league? Our cost for our league is $200 per team. That's a team of six players. You can have more than six players or you can have less than six players, but it's uh, $200 per team. We are the least expensive team in Denver. And part of that is because we're not in it to make a ton of profit. We're in it to pay the the costs of Casa de Paz, and I think that translates to our players. In addition to our volleyball league, we also have a night of drop-in, which is another fabulous opportunity to get community engagement because a lot of people aren't going to want to commit to six weeks of volleyball, but they could drop in on a Sunday night and just play for fun, and we charge $5 for drop-in. Uh, and uh, a lot of our players who come for drop-in have a blast, and then they decide to stay for the league too. Nice. Thanks, Sarah. So again, feel free, <clears throat> excuse me, feel free to use the uh, chat option to pose any questions to the panelists. And Timothy or Mimi, if you all um, can speak to any specific strategies or tools that you used on, on your way to your success story. Sure, I can, I can talk. Um, so, sorry, I'm just trying to advance the slides. Um, so one big strategy we used is we made a video as part of our Indiegogo campaign um, that our youth members brainstormed the scenario and script for, and then you know some young people and some of our staff acted in, and we kind of used humor to talk about how much it was limiting our work to not have a home. Um, and so this is a, the slide is an image from the video. Um, and basically we were like posted up in an empty lot and kind of pretending to be having an office out of the empty lot. Um, and I think that like that use of humor and just that energy that kind of is like a window into the energy of the organization um, was successful in kind of making us stand out at a time when there are so many kind of like crowdfunding campaigns out there. Um, another really big part of why this was, was successful was more than like any other grassroots fundraising we had done in the past, everyone got involved. So all of our staff, all of our members, um, most of our board members. And I think because the situation felt so urgent to us and particularly for our members, it was affecting them so much directly to not have an office. Um, it was really like easy to motivate everyone to get involved. Um, and so that, was part of how we were able to spread the fundraiser so far and, and get so much support was that we just had so many hands on deck sort of sharing it on social media, sending emails to their friends, texting their friends, um, you know, calling people. Um, I think another part of our success was that we 
tapped into an, so a lot of the people who donated were people who already knew the organization, but we also got donations from people who weren't familiar with PSU before from outside of Philadelphia. And I think part of that was we tapped into a larger issue, um, specifically gentrification, that so many people are concerned or really angry or upset about, but there's not always like a concrete thing that people know that they can do. Um, so I think for some people this, who maybe didn't know anything about our, our organization before, um, this was like a way that they could take action on that. Um, and one other kind of like more mundane thing was before we launched this, um, we had already sort of, because through our organizing work, built up a really strong social media presence. So we had like a few thousand followers on Facebook and, and Twitter. And we didn't, we weren't doing that with the intention of fundraising there, but um, it ended up being a big asset and just spreading the, the fundraiser farther. Thanks, Timothy. And I want to, um, I want to, Mimi, we'll give you a second to reflect on that if you have anything to add. But I'm going to cut in with a question from Lisa. And Lisa is asking if you all can share a little bit more about the nuts and bolts. Um, how did you train and prepare your member uh, leaders or youth uh, as a, uh, to begin to fundraise? How did you prepare your leaders to begin to fundraise? For example, um, was it just a one evening workshop or did you talk about it regularly in the organization? How did you prepare folks to fundraise? Um, that's a great question. Um, I feel for us, at least at Soul MB Seeds, uh, we were able to tie our fundraising or grassroots fundraising strategies already kind of weave it into the braid of the work that we were already doing. So. For BCs, uh, the work that they were doing is doing media training with uh, young people in middle school and high school. Um, and then uh, when we decided to do 500 for five, what we did is we, we, did, we broke bread with each other. We had food and we had conversations and, and dialogue about um, what were the things that, you know, uh, we struggle with when it comes to asking folks uh, to, to resource our, our movements. And so we had maybe three to four dinners, like for a month, um, where we had these conversations and we brought together um, supporters uh, intergenerationally. So we had young people there, we had some elders, and then we had, you know, folks who are all coupled up who, you know, have shared incomes and have decided that they want to not only give, but also bring in their friends to give. And so for us, it was breaking bread, having dialogue, um, and then really weaving our fundraising strategy with the work that we were, we were already doing. Um, and then uh, for us, it was also about skills and resource mapping. So in the room, when we did 500 for five, there were folks who had, you know, eight years, 10 years of experience fundraising. And then we had other folks who had never done fundraising at all. And so it was really this kind of like sharing of skills, sharing of knowledge and kind of having folks who had been doing, you know, the fundraising for eight years to be real about the challenges and, and to talk about, you know, class, uh, to talk about our experiences with money and to really like be able to like build with each other those relationships of trust to have those conversations about money. Um, additionally, you know, everyone was able to bring something to the table. Uh, folks, you know, every person was able to make a, a video and work with uh, B Seeds to make their own video and talk about what were the five things that they were um, going to, to let go um, in their daily lives to be able to support this campaign. So some folks were like, uh, I'm going to give up uh, the cover charge to our crappy club here in Denver who is like super racist and like transphobic. Like, I don't even want to go there. Like, why am I like spending cover charges there? Or some people were like, I drink a latte every day. Like I drink coffee every day. And so when folks were able to like really personalize what they were giving up for themselves to be able to like fund a 500 for five, that ask was, was so much um, easier to ask for their friends, right? Like it wasn't just like, give and but it was really an example um and so you know we were able to have like folks who had really like high technological skills or filmmaking skills or design skills come together with folks 
who had more fundraising knowledge. And um, I think that really built everybody's skills up. So the folks who had done fundraising but had never done design or film or script writing, they were able to gain those skills as well. And so we kind of made this, this small community of folks who were just you know, sharing their experiences and building skills together in order to, to have 500 for five be a success. Thanks, Mimi. That's a great answer. Um, so two, I think, so Mimi draws out on two key pieces that GIFT emphasizes as well. Um, so, and we addressed it a little bit earlier as well, get everyone involved. And Timothy talked about that as well. So get everyone involved. That's, that's the first way to address uh, a shortage of staff, right? And at the end of the day, um, we've also seen that that strategy really generates uh, just a lot of morale and good feeling and kind of engagement in the process. So get everyone involved at all levels. Um, and then weaving your programming into your fundraising so that they're not individual pieces of work. You're not programming and fundraising. The most ideal is when you can find ways to weave that together so that your programming is your fundraising and vice versa. Um, so we're, we're running out of time here. And I'd like to go to, I'd like to give you all an opportunity to speak to um, any challenges that you've encountered in grassroots fundraising. Um, and so just keep your remarks kind of brief. Any challenges you've, inc you've encountered in grassroots fundraising and, and how did you work to overcome those to address those? My my biggest challenge, and you talked about it briefly, Veronica, is just asking, um, and uh, because nobody likes to be told no. But here's how I have become better at it. I'm not great, but here is, here is how I've become better at it. I know what I need for the CASA. We are working on buying an actual home. Right now, we're in an apartment. So if I know what I need, I need money for a down, I need $60,000 for a down payment for the CASA. It is much easier to ask when you have a specific thing that you need. And then you feel more confident about it, especially if you believe in what your, your goal is. That's it. Thank you, Sarah. Um, one challenge that came up specifically in the example that I was talking about was a, a lot of like fear and even shame around admitting that we had been evicted and lost our office. Um, and I think that before we decided to do this really public fundraiser around it, we felt like it was somehow um, would make us almost like look bad to admit that we didn't have an office or that we had been evicted or um, had been in that position. Um, and so that was a really big hurdle to overcome because the only way this was gonna be successful is if we could be really blunt about the urgency of the situation. Um, and I think it sounds cheesy, but the way that we pushed through it was just realizing that like, it was a risk that was worth taking and that asking for help could end up being much more powerful than trying to deal with it all on our own. Um, and when we did, I mean, when we did ask for help, we got a really positive response. I don't think we had any kind of one come to us or any you know organization come to us and be like why did you let this happen to you i um i think for myself um i'm kind of in the same way of where sarah's going um i was really afraid to ask and that comes with you know growing up you know and this is an experience that a lot of folks who are you know folks of color or come from like low um income backgrounds like just the shame and like also all the baggage that comes with like surviving um as young people but what really helped me was to start shifting my relationship with with money um and also numbers like as an artist like i grew up all my life being like numbers oh they're not my friends but actually when i started to to be able to look and see, I'm going to go do a 90s reference and, and see the matrix, right? See all those numbers, but be able to, to kind of hear the poetry that, that came from those numbers. Um, I was able to like really pass, um, kind of that barrier that I've had for a long time. Um, cause when, when you see those numbers and you, you see the work that can happen in community through those numbers, I think that I was able, I was able to shift that 
and and really to come at it in a place of abundance and gratitude that even when people say no um to appreciate their time and their consideration to just talk to, to for them to learn about what we're doing in community and what movement and what liberation that we're trying to bring together as a community so abundance and gratitude i think if i can add something sort of along those lines too about asking something that um similarly has helped me become more comfortable asking is knowing that or seeing people who decide to donate feel really positive and like connected to the work afterwards and seeing how it gives them like a you know how they it's it's something that they get a positive experience from and feel connected to this movement that maybe they would feel less connected to before or they end up being more likely to come out to one of our rallies or direct actions because they've made a $30 donation um and that I try to remember that when I'm going into asking people because it's like instead of thinking about it as a negative thing, I'm like, oh, I'm giving them an opportunity to be involved in something that they clearly believe in and care about. Absolutely. I love that, Timothy. Um, I say that to folks in training all the time is the first biggest challenge is to remind ourselves that we are offering somebody an opportunity, right? So, and, and asking for the money, asking for the donation is the way that we make that opportunity become possible. But to think of ourselves really as folks who are walking around this world, offering people an opportunity to do something good and right for their community, right? That's who we are as fundraisers. So um, we are at the end of our time together. I hope that uh, our time together has been helpful to those of you joining us for today's webinar. Um, I want to thank the panelists, each of you, Sarah, Timothy, and Mimi for joining us today and for sharing your experiences. Um, and then I want to sh uh, thank Eric and Will as well um, from Funders Collaborative Youth Organizing uh, for having us on today. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Veronica, for pulling all of this together and thank you to all the panelists. It makes, you know, uh, it, it makes this work so much more real. So we really appreciate all of you sharing these, these lessons. Um, if folks have a minute to fill out a very quick evaluation, um, uh, I'm putting the, the link in the chat. Um, we really want your feedback on this webinar, what was useful, what could be more useful, and what other topics for webinars would you like to see in the future? We, we try to keep these uh, webinars as relevant to your work, um, so we'd love to get your, you know, your feedback on what was good and your ideas for the future. So I just uh, pasted a, um, a link in the chat. You can use that to give us some feedback and give us some ideas for the future. Um, and then again, I just really want to thank um, uh, Veronica and Gift and all of our speakers on this webinar, um, Mimi, Sarah, and Timothy, for, for sharing everything that, that you did. Your, your work is really inspiring. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, we don't encourage people to give up on foundations, you know, but, but to remember that it's only one part, right? And, and that we want to build long-term sustainability for our organizations. This grassroots fundraising work is, is, is really critical. Um, and I know I hear a lot of folks say, well, it's, it's just easier to write one big grant, you know, um, uh, or, you know, we tried grassroots fundraising and, and we didn't get immediate results. Um, but I think what you see here is you see examples of organizations that have really invested the time uh, in, 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 in and, and engaged their, their members and their leaders and that over time, then that can really have powerful long-term results and make the organizations more sustainable. So, um, uh, we, you know, we think this is really promising. We really appreciate all of you sharing this. And uh, again, give us, a, please uh, fill out the evaluation, give us feedback and let us know what other topics you'd like to see. We are planning an, our, our next Youth Corps webinar for, the, for late October. We haven't settled the date yet, but we're going to be looking at uh, the at the justice reinvestment framework that a lot of organizing groups are using these days. How do we uh, defund the institutions that are harming our people and our communities and use those resources to fund the things that we know we need? Uh, uh, the Movement for Black Lives, uh, a lot of juvenile justice groups, mass incar incarceration groups are using this as a strategy. And we think there's a lot of uh, things that can be learned from that strategy. So we'll be looking deeply at how are youth organizing groups uh, uh, employing that strategy and what can we learn from it so that that'll be our topic for next month uh, so look out for for uh, an, e uh, an email from FCYO on the details for that when it's coming it should be a really good one and again just really want to thank all the panelists for today really appreciate it
Thanks, Eric. And uh, just, just to let you all know, we've uh, included our contact information here. So all of the panelists uh, welcome you reaching out to them with any follow-up questions that you have. They're happy to share. Um, so feel free to use that contact information as it's helpful to you. And then also remember to visit our website at grassrootsfundraising.org uh, for access to all kinds of resources at that website. Thank yeah, you if you got... If you all got excited about doing this and you want to know more, GIFT is such a, a powerful resource and really encourage people to get involved and go to the conference and do the trainings. Uh, if you want to do this, but you think you need some more help to do it, they have, they have a lot of resources. So definitely encourage people to take advantage of that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, somebody just asked, I'll say about the recording. We, the webinar is recorded and we will post it on our website in the next couple of days. Um, so if you if you missed parts of this, if you want to share it with other, you know, uh, other folks in your organizations uh, in the next couple of days, it'll be posted. If you go to go to our web, our, our the FCYO website at uh, FCYO.org, um, you can uh, go to resources and, and you'll see links to our past webinars and, and this one will be included there pretty soon. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care.